Okay, I think it's uh, time to start. I would like to welcome everyone to uh, the research seminar of the Center for Institutional Studies at HSC University in Moscow. Uh, we are very pleased and indeed fortunate to have as our speaker tonight, uh, Professor Andrei Markevich from the New Economic School. <laughs> Andrei Markevich uh, hardly needs an introduction. He is one of Russia's leading economic historians published uh, numerously in uh, highly ranked journals on various issues of the Russian and uh, Soviet uh, economic history. <laughs> Andre is uh, a bachelor is from the Department of History of Moscow State University. His PhD is from Institute of History of the Russian Academy of Science. <clears throat> Andre's topic tonight is the political economic causes of the Soviet Great Famine. 1932, 1933, and Andre, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for so uh, warm welcome. Uh, tonight I will talk about um, the Soviet Great Famine and its political economic causes. And uh, the largest famine in the Soviet history happened in 1932, 33. Uh, so let me motivate the whole famine studies uh, by a simple fact. In the 20th century, there were more famine deaths than deaths uh, from uh, both uh, First and Second uh, World Wars. Uh, Soviet famine, uh, which, which, which we study and the, the, the paper which, on which I pre I'm presenting today, uh, is the largest Soviet famine, but it's the second largest uh, famine by total deaths in the 20th century after the great Chinese famine. If you consider mortality rates, uh, they are similar in, in both famines. Uh, so you can this this chart uh, this charts give you an idea what happened in the interwar period in the Soviet Union. Uh, you, you may see that there is a clear spike in mortality in 1933, the main famine year. And actually, mortality started to, to, uh, to increase a bit earlier in 1932, otherwise it's pretty flat. Of course, uh, in this flat, there is no 1932, in, in, in this figure, there is no 1932, famine because there are no data on, good data on that and there is no second world war so it's not the only demographic catastrophe which happened in the country in the first uh, in, in the first half of the 20th century but uh, this is uh, this is the major one uh, in the in, which occurred in the interwar period natality tells you a similar story there is there is a clear there is a big decrease in number of births uh, in the early 30s but it's a bit flatter than uh, than spike in 1933 uh, in which happened with deaths all in all, there were seven million deaths, uh, uh, and this is in, in this time. And this is the most common, commonly cited figure, but uh, we don't know precisely how many people died. And estimates vary between 5.5 million and 10 uh, and above 10 uh, million people. Uh, what is uh, probably even more important, and what and this is this this is uh, the uh, the subject of our study, is that mortality was very unequal. It was very unequal uh, between uh, urban areas and rural areas. It was high in much higher in rural areas than in cities, and and it was particular and it was particular pronounced for particular groups. Yes. There, is a, there are many questions in charts. I oh, know it's, it's not chat. Uh, no, this is just like uh, we ask people to register. So I, I will keep uh, an eye. On, I will keep an eye on the on the questions. And if I see any proper questions, I will let you know. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, uh, this is okay. technical, Andre. There are no questions so far. So please proceed. Okay. Good. Good. Thank you. Uh, so. Uh, you may see uh, from uh, on this. So the major the major reasons the regions which suffered most of all from from this famine were uh, Ukraine and Kazakhstan. Uh, I should 
say straight away that there are no data, no disaggregated data on Kazakhstan. So in this uh, today, I'm talking. I will mostly talk about Ukraine and most and Ukrainians. Uh, we, our data don't cover Kazakhstan, and we don't we, we can't say much about them. Uh, of course, once such big event occurred, it's it's a normal. It's a natural question to ask what happened and what shaped such famine outcomes outcome. And this topic is highly controversial. So the Soviet government basically denied any famine uh, till late uh, late late eighties. More recently, uh, Russian parliament, Ukrainian parliament, European parliament made particular statements on this event. And there are th there is heated debate on famine causes in the literature. On the one side, uh, one, one scroll, some, some scholars argue that famine was intend, basically intended by the Soviet government either to control grain production in Ukraine or even some people uh, claim that to uh, uh, annihilate the ethnic Ukrainian population in the Soviet Union. On the other side, there are scholars who uh, argue that there was no systematic bias in famine deaths against Ukrainians, or if such bias exists, it, it was driven by confounding factors, like weather, first of all. So it was not intended by the government. The government did it best, but it finally happened. Uh, and the main, the major problem with this literature is that it is mostly descriptive. That, uh, there are mo mostly historians who talk about uh, about uh, uh, the Great Soviet Famine, uh, and they provide dif different narrative in support of their claims. So, and this is because there is a big challenge, and this big challenge is that there is no representative disaggregated data. Uh, to simultaneously examine competing hypotheses. And this is what this paper does. We collected uh, and construct the largest and the most comprehensive data sets in the, for the interwar Soviet Union to the best of our knowledge from archival and published sources. We also use obviously geospatial data uh, and our data set exists in two, in two formats. First, we, we, we have for, province level panel, a big one, and the district with relatively few observations in the cross sections, but many, many, many time periods. And second, we have district level panel, uh, uh, we, where we have more than 1000 districts in the cross section, but only two, two years uh, in this panel. As I said before, uh, our data don't cover the whole Soviet Union. For example, we don't have data on Kazakhstan because, because they basically, I guess, don't exist. Uh, but our data cover Russian Federation, Ukraine, and Belarus. And 80% of population of the Soviet Union in, in these years lived there. And uh, this, uh, this is where more than 80% of grain was produced. So you might think about our data as uh, about, about our data set as data set covering uh, the whole more or less the whole territory of the USSR. So what we do, we can we try to control for as many confounding factors as we can and just distinguish between competing hypotheses. Uh, and we also provide uh, I would say suggestive evidence. Uh, uh, for for the mechanism of the famine, why we we provide evidence and discuss why it happened. So let me give you a flavor <laughs> how Russian archives look like and where the data come from. This is uh, this is basically uh, uh, the uh, the the building and the room there more or less all Soviet statistics uh, is preserved. This is a so-called хранилище Центрального статистического управления в государственном архиве российском государственном архиве экономики. So it's it's it, this is this is the major place where we 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 got archival data, but of course we also used uh, 
published published sources as well, and many of our uh, our data comes uh, come from them. If you are interested in these details, please go to the appendix of the paper, which is on which is available online, and the appendix is I think at least 30, 30 pages long. <laughs> Uh, in part, so, so once we collected this wonderful, wonderful data, we focus on two specific questions. First, we ask, did ethnic Ukrainians experience higher feminine mortality? And second, we ask, was this due to systematic bias in Soviet economic policy or factors outside the control of the government in 1952? So in addition, we provide a large body of descriptive evidence to shed light on the potential drivers of Ukrainian bias, defined Ukrainian bias in Natalia. Quite clear one. Uh, so main, main results, uh, let me preview them. If uh, I, I, I hope I will present them in detail later, but just in case, let me let, let, let me preview them here. Uh, so first, we find that famine mortality is positively associated with Ukrainian with ethnic Ukrainian population share at the province level. This is very robust results. Uh, it is it is uh, uh, it stands if we control for weather, per capita food production, various demographic characteristics, geography, various pre-famine characteristic, uh, uh, characteristics uh, and institutions and policies, alternative measures of Ukrainians, uh, and so on and so forth. And the, uh, this, this, this association is, is, is true for, for only for the famine year. It doesn't, it, it, we, we check whether there is similar pattern for, for the previous the biggest uh, famine for which we have data, this is uh, 1892 famine, the largest imperial famine uh, uh, in, in Russia. Uh, these results hold if we omit uh, the Republic of Ukraine, of Ukraine from our sample and consider variation in ethnic, Ukraine, in ethnic Ukrainians outside Ukraine. Uh, next, uh, once uh, we switch to district data, we find a clear discontinuity at the Ukrainian border, uh, so which disappears once we control for the share of Ukrainians. And this is important results to distinguish between administrative and ethnic, ethnic, ethnic factors you know, uh, in, in, um, in, in famine. And uh, as I said, uh, so I already mentioned this district level results. These results holds once we go to district level. And moreover, they hold uh, within the province. Uh, so once we control for province year fixed effects. So if you think that there was a particular, I don't know, regional party secretary who is responsible for such outcome at the province level, this, this is gone because uh, this results with such specification, we show that these results holds within, within provinces. Our back of envelope calculations uh, imply that uh, the bias against ethnic Ukrainians contributed 77% uh, of famine deaths in Russia, uh, Ukraine and Belarus in our sample. And if it take Ukraine alone, 92%. Uh, so next, uh, what we do, we discuss uh, potential potential factors uh, which affect. Uh, uh, Andrei, yeah, there is a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there is a question from uh, Leonid. Should I go back? So it's about like. A... Uh, Andre, I didn't want to abuse my uh, privileges of the chair, but I have a question. Can you please explain how you established the Ukrainian ethnicity? Who who was the Ukrainian? Self-reported or? Sure, sure, sure. Of course, uh, the major source uh, uh, is uh, population census 1926. Uh, according to, to demographers and uh, demographic historians, this is the best, probably the best uh, census ever conducted in, in, in Russia. <laughs> uh, so this, this, this is from this census, but on top of that, uh, we use uh, Mother Tonga language also from this census and also Mother Tonga language from the Imperial census. Thank you. And the results are very robust to, uh, 
various definitions of Ukrainians. Uh, so let me let me talk uh, about uh, our findings, uh, uh, which tell you something about drivers of uh, of the Great Soviet famine. So first, what we show we show that Ukrainians resisted collectivization more than other ethnic groups before the famine. So collectiv collectivization started three, basically three years before the famine. And uh, during these years, uh, Ukrainians uh, resisted more. I, I will show you these results. Uh, next, what we show, we show that Ukrainian famine mortality increase, uh, was increasing in regional economic importance to Soviet agriculture. Uh, which we measure with grain production before the first five-year plan in 1928. And it also increased, and Ukrainian famine mortality increasing in political loyalty and state capacity measures. Importantly, these factors, all these, all these factors, uh, economic and political ones, are unrelated to famine mortality in regions without Ukrainians. So we didn't matter outside ethnic Ukrainian uh, agents. Once we do a horse race between economic and political factors, economic importance wins. In other words, it means that these uh, this, this, uh, this findings uh, are against the claim that the regime intended to exterminate ethnic Ukrainians for reasons unrelated to grain production. Uh, next, what we find, we find similar patterns for intensity of collectivization and grain procurement as policy outcomes. So instead of, uh, instead of, instead of uh, famine mortality, we have grain procurement and collectivization measures as policy outcomes, as dependent variables, as policy outcomes. We also show that uh, these, uh, these policies are positively associated with famine mortality. But uh, this is this is probably a common knowledge, so it's not a big surprise. Uh, but this policy were heavily implemented in more heavily implemented in ethnic Ukrainian regions. We also show an opposite pattern for the allocation of tractors, and this also I think this is also quite important because this policy was also centrally planned. Uh, large me mechanization was arguably the only positive outcome of collectivization. So we find uh, very different pattern uh, in, uh, in, 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 in allocation of tractors. Ukrainians got them less during the thing. So once, once you take all these findings together, the question is how to interpret them. So we argue that these findings are consistent uh, with the view on the uh, uh, view on the regime's repression of Ukrainians as driven by desire to control uh, grain production together with its fear of Ukrainian national resistance. So the, the, the government wanted uh, control grain, Ukrainians produced uh, the, the, the most, the bulk of, of, of grain output, they resisted to collectivization more, so once all these factors uh, uh, became in operation together, famine happened. Uh, with our with this find with this finding we view these findings re uh, related to the following literature. First, it, they are obviously uh, related with Russian and Soviet political uh, economic history literature. Uh, for the 19th and 20th century, there are growing number of studies uh, uh, on, on that. Uh, we think, for example, if, if you think that our story is our, our story is a combination of economic and national or political factors, uh, uh, which led to to such. Uh, 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 to such poor outcomes. So you think about Grosfeld, Sakali, and Juravskaya paper, they basically tell a similar story about pogroms as an outcome of political and economic factors uh, in the Russian Empire. Uh, next, we, our paper is related to ethnic bias and masculine literature. There are 
a couple of papers which fit at, uh, which model these events. And our results are broadly speaking consistent with, uh, the, with, this, uh, with these theories. Uh, if, uh, in particular, Esteban et al. paper argues that uh, uh, such, such shocks uh, are more likely uh, with, uh, abund in the presence of abundant uh, natural resources. So if you think about agriculture as a natural resource, uh, this uh, our story is consistent with uh, with their with their theory, and of course our paper contributes to to famine studies. There are many great scholars uh, wrote on that, but mostly in different in different contexts uh, in contexts of Ireland, uh, India, China, and so on and so forth. And uh, our paper. Uh, is uh, about Soviet Union. It is most closely related with uh, Naum Nauminka single offer paper, uh, which uh, focuses on Ukraine only and uh, on, on, on the link between collectivization and famine. Here we study a different question and use larger larger data set. Uh, so let me start with historical background and then I will present two sets of results. First about ethnic bias, second about possible, uh, possible drivers of, of this bias. Uh, hopefully, I very much hope that in this audience I sh shouldn't speak much about, about Russian history and should and could skip such big events like revolution, uh, 1917 revolution and don't explain uh, what, it, what happened. Uh, I start directly with a uh, collectivization event. Stalin made a decision about mass collectivization in 1929. Was it started? Uh, it, it was uh, this policy started to implement uh, in this in this year. In 1930, there was a party congress uh, which uh, adopt, uh, which voted for 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 this policy. Of course, it was for sure Congress, but I mentioned it here because we use data on delegates to this Congress as a particular measure or of, uh, you can interpret it differently, either as political loyalty or state capacity in particular territories, but still we, 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 we use this measure. And so that's why I mentioned this party Congress here. Uh, first, the news about, about possible famine I, uh, arrived to Moscow in, in 1931, but instead of uh, but the decision which the government made was was not uh, was quite specific. Uh, grind procurement targets uh, were increased, uh, and in 1932 additional harvest uh, shortfalls happened, and this eventually turned uh, transformed in, into big and heavy. Uh, heavy famine in uh, the very late 1932, spring 1933. Major, major deaths happened in 1933. In 1934, mortality came back to, uh, to, to its trend, to its, to its relatively normal uh, level. Uh, some basic facts about Soviet agriculture, which are important for, for this paper. So uh, first, uh, uh, it's important to underline that for the government, uh, it was very important to control agricultural production and distribution. Uh, because it was a kind of a necessary condition for the industrialization and the regime stability. So agriculture was the largest largest sector. The natural uh, sector from which to get uh, savings and to invest in the industry. And also the government needed grain to feed population in, in cities because uh, Bolsheviks probably learned quite well uh, the, the lesson from the 1937, uh, 1917 revolution uh, when uh, there were big problems with uh, supply of grain to, to, to Petrograd and other big cities. 
uh, grain, uh, so agriculture was important and grain was a major agricultural product. The fact which is probably less uh, well known is that Ukrainians uh, composed a majority in so-called grain production areas in the Soviet Union. Of course, they were only the second largest group, ethnicity group in, in, in the country. But if you focus only on grain production areas, they were basically in, uh, in, a, in relative majority. So, uh, so once the government wanted to control grain, it was to a huge extent the task to control uh, areas where Ukrainians live. Uh, the solution to control agriculture was collectivization. Under collectivization, uh, food production was organized in teams. Uh, these teams um, had to follow instructions on production from the center, issued by the central government. Uh, once harvest happened, uh, first the government compulsory procured particular amount of grain. And what has remained uh, was distributed within these teams, within these collectives. It's important to underline that trading of food stuff was banned. So at least in the early 30s government to try to control all grain production and distribution in the country. If uh, peasants resisted to such policy, uh, it was suppressed. Uh, the largest, uh, the largest uh, suppression policy was decolonization. Uh, kulaks means rich peasants, and we were supposed to 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 be liquidated. That meant, in that context, to be sent uh, to to Siberia for permanent settlement. Uh, so this, this, this are stylized text about Soviet, Soviet agriculture. What else we need for this paper is stylized text about Soviet national, national policy. Uh, the civil war showed that ethnic tensions within the country were very strong. It led to increase in national movements in the outskirts of the empire. So, Basically, the, Bel the Bolsheviks had to find a kind of a delicate balance between the need for the support of minority groups, ethnical minority groups, and their desire to homogenize the country, to build communists, and uh, I mean, to have only proletarians in the country, basically. Proletarian, as we know from, uh, from works, uh, such people like Lenin, uh, uh, Marx and so on. Uh, the proletariat uh, has no uh, has no uh, motherland. Proletariat uh, uh, Anyway, so so and uh, the Ukraine was one of the most problematic uh, area in the in this respect, as the civil war uh, made it clear. So in 1923, so-called indigenization policy was put into, into operation. And this policy aimed to neutralize nationalist separatist movements by providing legal forms of nationhood. And also this policy supported uh, local languages, culture, and so on and so forth. But the Bolsheviks always have, all the time had concerns that such policy would also strengthen nationalism. And these concerns increased during, during collectivization, uh, especially, and especially in respect to agricultural really rich regions. Uh, as Stalin put it already in 1925, the national question is in a sense a peasant question. Национальный вопрос, крестьянский вопрос. So, uh, the, 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 the main worry was that common ethnic identity and residential concentration made nationalism one of the key threats uh, to collectivization, and uh, especially in Ukraine. In, in Ukraine, there are plenty of examples of uh, strong resistance to collectivization among ethnic Ukrainians, as I already said, many historians claim 
uh, that uh, the resistance was the, was the highest and we actually show with, with, with data. Uh, there are also even tensions within the Communist Party. Uh, many ethnic Ukrainian party leaders uh, appeal to Moscow that something wrong go, goes on because we can't, um, I mean, outcomes is, 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 not, is not what was intended. Uh, and in the end, these concerns uh, transformed uh, uh, in the Politburo decision in December, in late December, in middle December 1952, uh, to basically to cancel indigenization policy in at least in Ukraine, in, in Ukraine, uh, Belarus, and European part of the country. Uh, there are no data, I mean, there are no direct data on uh, Stalin's decision that Stalin's ordered uh, famine. There are not, there are nothing, no such documents, nothing like that. So this, this, this decision which we cite here is probably the closest uh, uh, in, 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 to, uh, to I mean, uh, pro tells most open, explicitly talk about Ukrainian nationalists uh, within the Communist Party and the Ukrainian nationalists as the major, major threat to collectivization and the whole communist pro project. Uh, so once I briefly covered the, the background, let me go to, to, to data and uh, our regression results. I guess uh, this is what you're waiting for. Uh, so, so data, I already told that uh, our data set is mostly for Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus. We have province level data and district level data. Uh, I, sh I should say that we don't have ethnic specific mortality data, and this is probably the major limitation of the data. So what we do, we regress uh, mortality uh, on uh, ethnicity share and intra ethnic specific mortality uh, from, to uh, from total mortality and ethnic population shares. Uh, So this is this is the this is our sample in gray uh, and different uh, intensity of gray color uh, show you tell you uh, how many ex, uh, how many excess mortality deaths occurred in this region in 1933 uh, relative to 1928. Uh, this is the area, this is the so-called grain production, uh, pro grain producing area. And this is the Republic of Ukraine. Uh, this map tells you where Ukrainians live. I think Ukrainians lived in the Soviet Union in the 20s, according to, uh, to population census, to 1926 population census. Of course, the highest the, the highest share was in Ukraine, but not only. Uh, Kuban and, Do and Don regions uh, uh, had many Ukrainians. Also, thanks to Stalipin migration, there were uh, Ukrainians in in uh, in Siberia. Uh, so, what happened? I already showed you the huge spike. In, uh, in mortality and decrease in natality during famine years. But this, these graphs sh uh, also show you cross pro province uh, standard deviation relative to the mean. Uh, and you see that the variation in, uh, in uh, cross province variation during the famine substantially increased. So famine was very unequally distributed between, between territories. And this is what these graphs uh, tell you. 
main results. Uh, we, as I, as, I, as, I, as I already mentioned, we regress uh, mortality in year T plus one uh, on uh, Ukrainian share uh, times uh, famine dummy uh, and uh, set of controls, province fixed effect and year fixed effect. Uh, so we assume that major famine happened in 1932. So famine dummy stands for, equals to one in 1932 and zero, zero otherwise. The measure Ukrainian share of Ukrainians uh, with population, uh, with, census, with census data, and we take in the baseline specification, we look at rural share of Ukrainians. Uh, because famine was mostly uh, was mostly a rural phenomenon. Uh, we everywhere we control for uh, for grain production uh, and uh, grain production times times famine. Of course, you may say that uh, where grain production data come from, uh, you, you could raise concerns about quality of Soviet grain production figures. So we here in the baseline specifications, we don't use official figures. We use, we predict grain production with weather and, uh, weather and natural conditions. For that, we estimate weather-driven production function from pre-Soviet grain data set and apply uh, estimated coefficients to get to gain grain, grain output in particular uh, in particular year in particular period. We argue that grain production function didn't change much uh, between uh, during during these years. So uh, we think that this is a reasonable 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 procedure. The major results uh, in uh, in this table is that Ukrainian the main variable of interest is uh, positive and uh, uh, highly significant and very stable in magnitude between different specifications. Uh, if you read this coefficient uh, literally, it tells you that you have 100% of Ukraine. If you have a region with 100 ethnic Ukrainians during the famine year, the mortality, the mortality in this region uh, was 51% per thousand higher than in uh, other regions. Uh, uh, this control for grain predicted by weather with control with, with this control of grain predicted by weather, we basically control for 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 weather, and insignificant coefficient here tells you that uh, uh, if weather if it was weather driven famine, you should expect that uh, uh, you should expect negative coefficient uh, on uh, the interaction gra grain uh, times uh, times famine. Uh, but this is this is this is not the case. In the third and fourth specifications, we add uh, controls for decolocalization policy and a huge drop in livestock, which happened uh, as a result of collectivization. Uh, so livestock was the major capital. You might argue this changed changed uh, production function. So it's important to control for that for, for, for this factor. All uh, kulaks were the most productive peasants. So it might be this is another potential source of changes uh, of production function. So it's we control for them. Given that neither exile kulaks nor drop in livestock uh, vary over time if we interact with these variables with uh, feminine life. And in the last, okay, there is a question, right? Um, I don't see anything, so. 
Uh, Learning questions? Is there any direct measure? Yeah, of, uh, yeah. of, yes, we do have a direct measure of collectivization. Uh, uh, you probably want us to add this measure into the specification, but uh, collectivization is, is endogenous. It's a policy outcome. So we, can, we, we don't do that. Uh, uh, I will show you results late on collectivization later on. We do have this measure and uh, I, I, will, I will show you. We don't have this measure in the baseline because it's, it's endogenous. Uh, the last column, uh, in the last column, we remove uh, province fixed effects uh, and add uh, Ukrainians uh, as, a, as a variable. And I would like to attract your attention to this negative coefficient, which basically tells you that in non-famine years, mortality in ethnically Ukrainian, Ukrainian areas was less, not higher than in other regions. Uh, uh, this, uh, of course, we, we, allow, we allow the main variable of interest uh, very, very by, by time. And instead of one interaction, uh, Ukrainians, famine, dummy, we include uh, Ukrainian times year fixed effect uh, interactions in the regression. And this graph reports view coefficients on these on the, on this interactions. And you can see that, that this positive association between Ukrainians, share of Ukrainians and famine and mortality uh, uh, exists only, only for the famine year. And uh, in the other years, there is basically nothing, no pretrends. Well, there is some, something in, in, in the previous year, but this is fine because a famine started a bit earlier, but reaches, reached its height in, uh, in 1934. Uh, how, 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 stable, how stable these results, which we obtain, we, uh, we do the following exercises. First, uh, we, we try different uh, uh, Ukrainian measures. Uh, we, uh, oh, so, sorry, first, first we look uh, not at total mortality, but at uh, urban mortality and rural mortality separately. And you may see that there is no, no, no Ukrainian bias in cities. Uh, so, but uh, again, as we know, uh, famine was a, f a rural phenomena. The majority of victims were, were in countryside. So this is, this is expectable, expectable results, but this uh, regression just make it clear. Next, we try instead of rural Ukrainians, we try total Ukrainians and urban, urban, urban Ukrainians. Uh, coefficients here goes up, uh, but this is mechanical results uh, simply because there are quite few Ukrainians in Ukrainian, re urban Ukrainians in Ukrainian regions. Uh, Kyiv was a Russian city, for example, uh, and uh, similar situation were, were in different places in that time. In uh, columns six and seven, we measure Ukrainian, Ukrainian share differently. We use either Mother Tonga from 1926 population or Mother Tonga from uh, um, 1897 population census, which was the only uh, imperial population census in the Russian empire. In the last column, which changed definition on famine, and uh, define it, change definition on famine dummy and define it as equal to one in 1931 and 1932. Of course, uh, you could have concerns how well measured uh, mortality. Uh, I mean, it's, if, if you have a huge, uh, famine, uh, normally uh, registration system is destroyed. Uh, so uh, oh, this starts to work well, well, less well. So 
what we do, we try uh, to look at natality as a different uh, as a different indicator of uh, of uh, demographic process. And in famine years, natality is normally goes down. Uh, and the panel B presents exactly the same results as panel A, uh, but with uh, natality as, as a dependent variable. Next, we control for demographic and geographic uh, differences. Uh, uh, we control for demographic structure, uh, latitude and longitude. We are in column four, we are meet uh, Ukraine from our sample. In column five, we are meet major grain production areas. And in column six, we look at uh, the largest uh, Tsarist family. Uh, the results are quite stable in the first five five uh, columns and there are no effect, uh, no Ukrainian bias in the, during the Tsarist famine. We also control for alternative measures of decollectization, alternative measures of drop in livestock, uh, various measures of wealth, uh, pre-famine pre and pre-Soviet wealth, uh, which is arguably exogenous. Uh, his various measures of historical institutions, everything for, for that we managed to collect data. Uh, and uh, our results are quite, quite uh, stable. Next, let me show you district level evidence. Uh, it took a lot of time to collect this data, but we, they should show you famine mortality at district level in the Soviet Union in 1933 relative to, to excess natality, relative to mortality in normal year, which is this case 1928. Uh, we, we, we've, uh, we've more precise, more granular data. What we can do, we can, we can look at discontinuity at the Ukrainian border and the uh, column on the left uh, show you the result of this exercise, and you see, you may see a clear discontinuity. Uh, and uh, in, in the beginning of famine, once famine became became strong, the Soviet government uh, prohibited migration outside Ukraine. So you might you might think about these results in in, in, in this. Uh, uh, in this respect and think that this was the main, the main, main driver. But the problem is that once we control for share of ethnic Ukrainians, this discontinuity disappears. And this, uh, this is what the right uh, figure uh, tells you. And uh, this is, I think this is very important results because it tells you that not administrative boundaries, but ethnicities matter during this famine. Uh, we try to replicate the results which I presented you above at, uh, for the province level panel at the district level, uh, everywhere data allows us. And uh, uh, in this specification, we uh, control for province specific, uh, province specific fixed effects. Uh, if you think that uh, Soviet policies are implemented top down, you should expect similar results at the district level and at the province level. And this is indeed the case uh, uh, in, this, in, 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 in these tables and then in this sense, district level and panel, district, district level results and panel level and province level results are, tell you the same story. Uh, what uh, additional explanations uh, or alternative explanations of the mechanism uh, the, the, literature, the literature considers? First, the literature considers the mechanism of weather. Uh, we rule out with this uh, mechanism with, uh, with the control for grain predicted by weather. Our results are also robust if we explicitly control for weather characteristics. 
an, an alternative story is low food production due to policy, but famine due to inadequate relief. But then you should observe negative correlation between grain uh, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and famine mortality, and this is not the case. Then there is an alternative story for China, centrally planning rigidity. If you familiar with the famous Ban Meng uh, Qian and Yard, uh, it, it tells you this story about the great Chinese, Chinese famine. We don't find similar patterns uh, in, uh, in, in the Soviet case because then you should expect positive coefficient on grain, uh, on, on grain during the famine year. Uh, and an alternative uh, story might be something specific about uh, something, something particular about Ukrainians, Ukrainian culture or institutions. We do our best uh, directly control for such, such characteristics. And also we do placebo for the Tsarist famine and we don't see anything for this famine. Uh, back of envelope gives you, gives you big, big figures. I, I will not uh, pay much attention to these results because I see that I have only half an hour and I would like to present you the second, the second set of, of results about uh, potential drivers of Ukrainian, Ukrainian bias. So <clears throat> first, let me show you questions. Andre? Uh, uh, this is Lenny. I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, we would like to have at least 10 15 minutes before the expiration of our seminar time for QA. So, if we can mm -hmm. please wrap up in about 10 15 minutes, that sure. would be appreciated. Yeah, Thanks that's, so that's, much. Yeah, yeah that's just fine. To, yeah. to have a chance to discuss. No, 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 no. Thanks cool. so much. I have only seven, so, so, uh, seven slides uh, left. Oh, uh, I'm sure we have a lot to say. So, <laughs> so I, I will manage. So, first, please, I, prom I promised you to show. Uh, the results that uh, U Ukrainians resisted collectivization more. Uh, we collected uh, data on, from secret police reports on uh, open terrorist acts, uh, at least what secret police call terrorist acts, uh, mass demonstration and political efforts. We construct the first principal component of these three measures, and then we regress uh, this uh, this uh, uh, this measure of resistance uh, in 1932 and 1951, average in in these two years on uh, share of Ukrainians collectivization and Ukrainian collectivization interaction. So. Conditional on the same level of collectivization, Ukrainians uh, Ukrainians resisted to collectivization more. And this is the major uh, the major takeaway from uh, from uh, from this table. Of course, a caveat uh, you should have in mind that this is a cross section result uh, to province level, and we have only nineteen provinces in this cross section. Uh, what we do next, we, we, we look at uh, grain uh, as, as a driver of, uh, uh, of famine, as, a, as, an important, as, a, as an important economic variables which shape Soviet policies and famine outcomes. Famine outcome. Uh, we take uh, grain production in 1928 the last year before uh, the last year the first year of five year plan or the first or the last year of nap uh, and uh, interact it with uh, our main variable of interest ukrainian uh, share of ukraine ethnic ukrainians time span so look at look at column, uh, panel A basically tell you that the addition of this of this uh, variable uh, doesn't change our main findings. Ukrainian bias bias survives, uh, the, but the most interesting results are in table in panel B. 
Uh, here you can see that the, this Ukrainian bias was mostly pronounced and in grain productive areas. Uh, and here you can see that uh, the, the coefficient on Ukrainians times famine variable itself is, is uh, uh, I don't know, sorry, I'm not, <laughs> I, I, I attract your attention to a different measure. I, I want I look at look here, the, the coefficient on the grain interaction with famine uh, measure itself is statistically insignificant. So grain mattered only in Ukraine, only in ethnic Ukrainian areas. Uh, in uh, second column, we repeat a similar exercise, uh, but uh, at, uh, for uh, for for the district level district level uh, data. Next, what we do, we take various measures of political loyalty and state capacity to the Bolsheviks of the Bolsheviks regimes, namely share of voting of voters for the Bolsheviks in 1917, Communist Party membership in, in 1922, 27, and 21, average average over over these three years, and share and uh, and number of delegates. Uh, at the party congress, and we distinguish the ethnicity of his delegates at this party congress. Uh, and we observe that all these measures are correlated with uh, famine, uh, Ukrainian famine mortality. So uh, if uh, there were some re reasons outside, outside grain, uh, they tell you uh, and the, the government had capacity uh, uh, to implement uh, policy, anti-Ukrainian policy for some other reasons. Uh, these uh, these uh, results don't, don't contradict these these statements. But what we can do, we can uh, we can take a principal component of these three political measures and run a horse race between economic explanation and this. Uh, these um, uh, politi political loyalty state capacity explanation. And once we do that, only economic uh, factor survives, and there is no, there is no, there, uh, there is nothing for uh, for for the first principle for for the loyalty first principle component. Basically, what this it tells you, it tells you that uh, 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 that uh, other fa factors which are were not correlated with with grain political factors which were not correlated with allocation with grain production before uh, before the start of the first five year plan. Uh, didn't didn't affect uh, famine uh, famine mortality. Uh, we sh I can show you dynamics. I skip that for the for the interest of time. And uh, last thing, last two things which I would like to show you is uh, what Timur asked in the beginning. Uh, about collectivization and, uh, and and grain procurement. So we first panel A show you the relationship between these uh, between these measures and uh, uh, famine mortality, and not surprisingly, uh, we find a positive correlation between collectivization. And, uh, and 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 famine mortality and on one side and procurement share and grain and famine mortality uh, this this is what column four shows you but what we do in panel b and c we uh, use these uh, these variables as uh, as dependent variables because we were policy outcomes and if the Defined, defined, uh, defined famine. They 
they should be, be, be and they, they likely were correlated with uh, uh, presence of presence of Ukrainians, and this is what we sh what we see in in uh, panel B, and in panel C we repeat, repeat we instead of double interactions uh, Ukrainian Ukrainian times famine we use triple interaction Ukrainians. Uh, grain uh, times uh, grain production time famine, so which tells you this this uh, this uh, which show you this mechanism which which I discussed I discussed uh, before. So taken together, this table and previous table tell you that uh, ethnic Ukrainian suffered high mortality during famine. They suffered. Uh, their mortality, the famine mortality was increasing in grain production, and uh, they were uh, uh, they were subject to more heavily implemented collectivization and procurement policy uh, during du during uh, uh, during the famine. So. Uh, uh, here I sh should probably stop and leave space uh, and, and leave time for questions. Um, oops. Well, uh, thank you very much for the interesting uh, presentation, Andre. So now the floor is open for questions. Um, Timur? Yeah, I had a question about the last point in the conclusion that that Soviet government didn't uh, target the Ukrainians per se as an ethnic group, but only in relation with the importance of the uh, of the grain production area. Uh, is, is, is that a correct interpretation uh, of the last table? Yes, uh, mm -hmm. I think so. This uh, so let me attract your attention to this insignificant position. So, mm -hmm. if it was, uh, uh, if it, uh, yeah. it Yes, I think this is this is this is correct interpretation of this table and the, and the next table which we, we which I which I just showed. You. I, I thought you asking about grain production. Are you and you asking about ethnic Ukrainians? Yes. So my, my question then would be that can you test a similar mechanism? So if if the po if the policy implemented was not targeted against Ukrainians per se, but uh, uh, the target was to collect more grain, and just it just happened that Ukrainians were in the uh, mostly in grain producing areas. No, 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 no. I think no? I think no. I, look, I think you got it not you got it wrong. It was it was it was a combination. You sh it should be grain production in region mm -hmm. and Ukrainians should be there. Mm -hmm. So because triple interaction is significant, and grain itself, as this column tells you didn't uh, didn't transform to higher uh, high mortality or more heavily implemented collectivization or procurement policy mm -hmm. so it's a, again it's a combination yeah. uh, it's a combination of uh, uh, presence of ukrainians and grain production so basically in this case you can't reject uh, the hypothesis that at least in some part, it was targeted against Ukrainians because of the resistance to uh, to well, resistance. No? Resistance. This is. I mean, resistance. This is uh, evidence are re on resistance are suggested. We we show that uh, uh, the government. This table show you that famine mortality was higher in uh, uh, areas there. Ukrainians were present, and the grain grain production was uh, was important was was high, 
but we can't say tell you why Ukrainians were so important for the Soviet government. Mm -hmm. And here we show you evidence about the resistance to the collectivization. Mm -hmm. And this is up to you to, to either to buy the combination of these two results or not. Mm -hmm. But uh, th there is historical narrative on that. And I think it's reasonable to combine these two results into, into one story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, and I have a, an additional question. So can you do a sort of a placebo exercise only for Russian uh, area or, or, or non-Ukrainian areas, for instance, for Russian and Belarus, and look at the interaction of uh, oh, intensity cool. of uh, collectivization and uh, grain production before collectivization used so that to test that uh, grain production was important. So I, I'm just wondering why it wasn't important in Russian grain producing areas for, for so in Don and Kuban, for instance. So because of Ukrainians, I mean, again. <laughs> <laughs> I see. So you, you are basically asking why Ukrainians matter. Mm -hmm. I, our data can't tell you, can't answer you this question. Uh, our our data tells you that a combination a combination of presence of Ukrainians and mm -hmm. grain production transformed into higher famine mortality. Mm -hmm. You're asking why? Mm -hmm. Our best response to, to this question is high resistance of Ukrainians to collectivization. Mm -hmm. Okay. In the Russian South, they, they probably also had high resistance both to both during the civil war and during the collectivization like okay we don't see this we don't see this in the data again here mm -hmm. conditional on the level of collectivization ukrainian and collectivization interaction is mm -hmm. strictly positive and significant and uh, of course, uh, there are many anecdotes that, can, that uh, there were plenty of resistance to the Bolsheviks in, the, in these regions as well. But all historians argue that uh, they, they more or less agree that Ukrainians resisted to collectivization more. Okay. And this is consistent what we see in the secret police report. Probably historians based their opinion on the same reports, but anyway, we, 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 we didn't estimate uh, regressions, at least. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Uh, sorry, I, I'm still thinking the, the exact question, but uh, yeah, I'm kind of thinking in the... <laughs> in the same lines of uh, Timur, like, um, yeah, I, I don't know if anything else can, can, be, can be done in order to, to see like, uh, uh, because I guess that there were some regions that uh, were also like uh, rich in producing grain, but uh, without Ukrainians. And if I understand correctly, in, in those regions, you don't see such big spikes in mortality as in those with Ukrainians. Correct. Yes. But uh, yeah. Um, um, another question, which well, I um, I don't know if it makes much sense, but uh, I'm wondering whether there is like a kind of a so like uh, here you, you observe the share of Ukrainians in a certain like a location. Um, I'm wondering if there's like sort of kind of threshold of let's say more than X percent of Ukrainians and then like uh, you see like a high mortality in that region or, or not like I'm wondering like whether you need like a certain number of Ukrainians in order for them to, for example, it, opposed collectivization or is it kind of linear in the number of Ukrainians? Well, we actually we didn't try that, but what kind of theory do you have in mind? Do you want to yeah. find, find 
uh, well, at, at the moment, <laughs> I'm just uh, thinking out loud, to be honest. I'm, I'm just thinking that I, I'm wondering, like, uh, maybe it would be interesting to, to see, like, uh, the kind of the minimum amount of people that you would need to try to organize some sort of resistance, even though in this case was clearly futile. Um, But yeah, I mean, I'm not sure. I, I was asking about resistance or about feminine materialism. I'm confused. Uh, no, no. Uh, we don't have a big panel about resistance. Okay. Unfortunately, unfortunately. we have uh, data on resistance only for two years, and uh, so which we collapse in one cross in one cross section. Okay, okay, no, no, never mind. <laughs> um. Okay, so um, I, I have one question as well. So about continuing on resistance and in general on sort of uh, attitudes towards Soviet uh, government. Uh, maybe I missed it, but did you have you used um, election data on 1918 constituents and assembly as a sort of a control for uh, voting for Bolsheviks as a control for political preferences? Yes. Yeah. I probably was. Mm -hmm. Leonid asked me to speed up, and I probably was too fast in this, mm -hmm. in this, in this, in this part. Uh, one second. So uh, it is here. Oops. Third column. So we have data on voting for the Bolsheviks. Mm -hmm. So we use it uh, first as a control. So obviously we interacted with feminine dummy because it doesn't vary over time. Uh, and next we also interacted with, uh, so here in, the, in, in panel A, we use it just as a control and the results are stable. And in uh, panel B, we also you we also have triple interaction of Ukrainians share of votes for the Bolsheviks feminine mm -hmm. uh, and uh, interestingly you have higher mortality uh, in uh, areas where you had uh, more Ukrainians and higher. Uh, share of votes for the Bolsheviks. So one way to, to read this result is that you had, you, you should have uh, supporters to realize, to implement you on the ground, to implement your policy. And uh, these are the people who voted for, for, mm -hmm. for the Bolsheviks. Same story for the communists. So once you have triple interaction, Ukrainians uh, uh, um, interacted with uh, communist party members, interacted with feminine dummy. And if you think about this as a, as a political loyalty or state capacity on the ground, once you have uh, this, uh, you, you have a positive uh, coefficient on this triple interaction, which tells you uh, that uh, one in area in ethnically Ukraine, in areas with high with high share of ethnic Ukrainians, state capacity was positively associated with feminine mortality. Mm -hmm. So this is this is what I'm trying to tell uh, before that here what we do we we try economic factor versus three various political factors, then we combine these three versus political, uh, three very different political factors into one principal component and run, and run horse race. Mm -hmm. And grain, uh, grain measure survives, while the coefficient on uh, this principal component of three political measures becomes insignificant which tells you that political factors outside 
uh, outside grain were not correlated with famine, with, with Ukrainian famine mortality. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, so if we don't have any further questions, thank you very much, Andre, for uh, presenting your paper for us. And well, thanks uh, to the audience also for staying here. And well, we have our next seminar next Thursday. And Roberto Bonfatti for universe, from the Universities of Padova and Nottingham is going to present the paper also, uh, like political, sorry, uh, economic history, uh, which is titled The Trade Disruption, in Industrialization, and the Setting Sun of British Colonial Rule in India. So that's going to be next Thursday, same place, same time. So you are all very welcome. And yeah, thanks, uh, Andre, once more. It was a pleasure to, to meet you online. And yeah, everyone have a good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was a pleasure to, pre to, to be here and to present. Bye-bye. Oh, Спасибо. Спасибо.